Let's pray together. Father, you have called us here this morning. Whatever hardships we're going through in our lives, we now lay these burdens down and we take our rest in you. So may your Holy Spirit infuse this room this morning. May your Spirit enter into our hearts and our minds. Meet us now as we approach you and as we praise you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, would you stand with me and let's sing our opening hymn, hymn number 256, Ye Servants of God.
thank you to all the musicians for that inspiring music. Today, we'd like to ask you to take a look at all the announcements in the bulletin. We can't uh, repeat all of them, but there's some important ones there for young adults and uh, youth as well. And uh, by the way, make sure you reset your clocks tonight uh, with the time changing tomorrow. And uh, we want to especially invite you to our Wednesday night Quinonia service and a Friday night uh, Praxis service. Many people are being blessed by that. If you haven't tried it, please do so. Koinonia is in the midst of a uh, three short week series on how to share your personal testimony of what Jesus is doing in your life. I'd like to uh, invite up uh, R.J. Beatty to represent the McGuire family today. From time to time in the life of a church, we need to just say thank you. And today we want to say thank you to one of the dear hearts of this community, Gloria McGuire. For more than three decades, she served this church. In fact, the whole McGuire family were people who uh, had the concept of service. Gloria can't be with us today for medical reasons. She's watching live now via the internet, and Gloria, we just want to say thank you and we love you today. Today, uh, we want to take a moment to express our joy and thanks for what she has done for us. She has a, a blood disease which has been progressing, and we had hoped that she would get well enough to come to church after she stopped her normal services over the past year, but that hasn't happened. So today we are saying thank you, Gloria. For more than 15 years, she served as the teacher in our beginners children's Sabbath school, and literally hundreds and hundreds of children were trained and blessed by her ministry. When uh, her health failed over the last 10 to 12 years, she backed off and saw that there was something she could do at home. Many of you parents have been blessed for your children with the little uh, packets that you get each week, the activity packets. Gloria did that for more than 10 years. And so today, Gloria, we want to say thank you for your love and service and goodness to our church family. And RJ, we'd like you to take this home to your grandma as living plants to remind her of our love and care for us, for her. Let's give her a token of our appreciation. <laughs> Boys and girls, it's time for the children's story. So if you come on up quickly and moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, everybody else, let's stand up, reach out and welcome each other to church. I still see some boys and girls that are sitting. All the boys and girls are welcome to join us this time. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. 
Hello. Hi. Good morning. Today, I want to put you to a test. And I want you to tell me if you know what these are and who these people are. So, are you ready? Look on the screens, either that screen or this screen right here, and tell me who this person is. A what? Some of you are not sure. Are, is it a firefighter? Yes? Okay, very good. You passed the test. Next. Very good. Whoa, I thought it was, this was going to be so hard. But you guys are nailing it. Excellent. Next. Are you sure? Are you sure he's a pilot? I think you're right. He's a pilot. How about this one? Really? Wow, that's so cool, isn't it? How about this one? A soccer player? Whoa, man, next time I'm going to, I have to make it a little, a little bit harder on you guys. How about this one? A teacher? How do you know he's a teacher? And he's next to your board and he's got a chalk on his end? Yes. How about this one? Yes, you guys are really, wow. I'm impressed. How about this one? What kind of bus driver, though? Very good, very good. How about this one? Really? What is he? I don't see a basketball there. How do you know he's a basketball player? Lakers. It's Lakers. How about this one? What is he? A pager. Wow, that's awesome. How about this one? A musician, a guitar player. Very good. Wow. Okay, we're almost there. How about this one? Yes. A priest. Yes. A what? A pastor. Yes, there are many names, right? Now, I want to ask you something. How do you know that all these people are who you say they are? Yes. Has we seen them before? I don't think you've seen this guy before, have you? No. How about this guy? Have you seen him before? No, but I've seen someone who drives a bus before. Okay, okay. How about you? How do you how do you know how do you know that he's a bus driver? Because he's standing next to a bus. How about this guy? Um, I know he's a race car driver because he's wearing a race car driver suit and a race car dri and it is a race car driver like a car right next to him or else he has a very very good Halloween costume. Maybe he does. Maybe he does. <laughs> how about how about her? How do you know that she is a what did you say she was? A soccer player. How do you know that she's a soccer player? Yes. Let me get a different person up. She has a soccer ball. Okay. How about him? How do you know he's a... Because he has a suit. That's right. That's right. Now, you wouldn't see someone with that suit up here preaching, would you? No. You would not see someone like that, rushing to fight a fire, would you? Well, yeah, maybe right after they get hurt, right? Yes. Or you would not see this guy uh, playing soccer with all that gear. It's going to be kind of hard, right? Well, do you know what? What we do and what we show tells a lot about us. Because depending on who you are, you're going to show who you are based on your appearances. This guy's a fighter man. He's a doctor, a truck driver. Oh, yes, I skipped one. You were right. I skipped one. She's a truck driver. And then we have the pilot in the cosmonaut. And you have different people that do different things. And based on how they look is that we know that they are. Now, if someone is wearing that and all of a sudden he walks in the uh, soccer field and says, today I'm going to play soccer, would you believe in what he says? Is he going to play soccer on that suit? Maybe. How about this guy? Is he going to fight? Is he going to uh, uh, 
uh, go to go to the moon on that clothes on that wearing dress like that wearing like that? No, he's not. He's not exactly. So it's not. It's not always what we say we are, but we show people who we are based on who we are. We can say that we are something, but we have to dress up like that, and we have to show who we are because that's what's inside of us. What I want you to remember is that it's not only what we say that it counts, but what we show to other people that who we really are. You can say that you are a good person, but deep down inside you may not show that you are a good person. You can say that you don't lie, but you can go around telling lies to a whole bunch of people. And we can, and that's for children and for grown-ups. Sometimes we say, oh, I like this person, and behind their back we're telling bad things about that person. It's not who we really are. So it's not only important that we show people who we are based on what we say, but also how do we show them that we are that good person. Do you remember that? Yes? Okay, today we have children's church. So I'd like to invite all the children between the ages of 4 and 12 to slowly walk and make your way out to children's church now, okay? Thank you for listening to the story. I hope you have a great Sabbath. Good morning, church. The offering for today will be going towards the church budget. In Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And also, in 2 Corinthians 9.7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a chill forgiver. Our deacons will now um, collect our offering.
with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this offering which uh, we have given to you. Um, please uh, uh, collect it and uh, multiply it as you have promised to do so with it and uh, help it to um, strengthen our community, our church, and the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen. I would like to invite all of those who have special prayer requests to come forward at this time as we sing hymn number 671. Those who are able, we invite you to kneel at this time. Our Father in heaven, you are the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all. How great, how wonderful is your name. We pray that your way of doing things, of treating people and loving people, of restoring nurturing and blessing people will become our way of life. We hope that the peace you bring to us, we can also bring that peace to others. We live today and every day by your life-giving word, and we don't trust in our own planning and effort. We ask for the grace to treat others the way you treat us, and to treat others the way we wish to be treated. 
Please guide our decisions daily. Bless this community with the presence of your spirit. Let us be a light to the city around us. We're thankful today for the healing and peace that you bring to us. We ask that we can be instruments of healing and peace for others in your name. We ask for a special blessing of healing and your presence for those who are sick and hurting today. Remember the requests of those who are um, bringing their petitions to you today. And uh, we ask that you uh, make us instruments of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the New Revised Standard Version, Matthew 23, 1 to 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted and res with respect in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one Father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Well, good morning again, church. Always happy to be able to share God's word with you. I invite you, if you have a Bible with you, open it up to this passage. Uh, we're going to be looking at it a lot in some detail. So, yeah, I want us together just to work through everything that we just heard. So if you have your Bibles or even on, on your phone or whatever, uh, look up this passage, Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Matthew 23, 1 through 12. So, have you ever heard someone say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious? I think one of the slogans, one of the catchphrases of our day is, I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And if you ask many non-Christians today why they don't go to church, often you'll hear something along those lines. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Or maybe... I believe in a higher power, but I don't subscribe to institutional religion. You know what I'm talking about? You've heard people say that kind of thing, right? And, you know, to be fair, I think we can sympathize with people who say those things. You know, a lot of people have had really negative church experiences, and the church is supposed to be this place known for love and inclusion and and forgiveness and compassion. But unfortunately, when you check out the research, studies indicate that the three things that people associate churches with, more than anything else, is intolerance, homophobia, and hypocrisy. That's just the statistics out there. And so Christianity and religion in general, it gets viewed with suspicion and it gets viewed with disdain because of the way so-called Christians like us 
have talked about love but refused to be loving, taught about forgiveness but shown no mercy, railed against judging but obsessed and obsessed over people's sins. In other words, people turn away from religion. People turn away from religion when the church preaches without practicing. And you also hear people say, I, I don't like religion because it impinges upon my personal freedom. Who is the church to tell me how I should live my life? How dare the pastor or how dare the priest claim so much authority when we know they're just as immoral as everyone else? And so then you might wonder, well, is this, is this slogan, I'm spiritual, not religious, is this confined uh, to non-Christians? No, it's not even confined to non-Christians, not at all. You'll hear more and more people within the church, you know, particularly I find this is true among younger people, saying the exact same thing. I consider myself spiritual, but I'm not really religious. In fact, uh, last week I posted something on Facebook about this, and I couldn't believe the amount of Christian friends that I had who basically said the same thing, that they thought religion was inherently bad. Now, I can handle that. That's fine, right? But perhaps the most shocking thing of all is that Jesus is the one who gets cited as the person who came to abolish institutionalized religion. This is what you hear people say all the time. Apparently they say, Jesus comes to free us from religion and replace it with this vague notion of niceness and civility. And you, why am I talking about all this? Well, the reason I'm talking about th this long introduction is because I think that today's passage is exactly the sort of text that people use to support this idea. Surely Jesus hates the scribes and the Pharisees. He came to replace the Old Testament law with this new principle of love, didn't he? Jesus told us just to be, you know, just to be nice people. Well, that sounds very easy and that sounds very convenient, but friends, I can tell you, that's just not true. And just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend sin, and I'm not trying to defend corruption that has taken place within the church. In fact, one of the lectionary readings from today is a, is a passage from Malachi chapter 2. And in this passage, the prophet talks, well, it's actually God talking here, very realistically about the fact that leaders do mess up and about the fact that religion does tend to go wrong. Check out this passage from Malachi. It says, for the lips of a priest, you could say pastor, for the lips of a priest or pastor should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But, talking to the leaders, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi. That's the covenant of priests, right? Says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all people, inasmuch as you have not kept my ways, but you have shown partiality in your instruction. So can church leaders fall into sin? Yes. Can religion go wrong? Absolutely. And it often does. But Jesus isn't anti-religious. I mean, just think about who Jesus is, right? Jesus is a law-abiding, synagogue-attending, Sabbath-keeping, first-century Jew. And far from dismissing the religious texts, Jesus says everything written in the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms, in other words, all of the Old Testament scrolls, they're all about me. Jesus, as you know, understood his messianic identity as firmly rooted in God's covenant. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon ever, Jesus doesn't abolish the law. Jesus actually intensifies the law. 
Jesus says, whoever is angry with his brother is guilty of murder. Jesus says, whoever even looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery. Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Doesn't sound like Jesus hates religion to me. And when we look more closely at today's scripture, we see that Jesus is not anti-religion at all. If you notice in, in verse 3 there, Jesus doesn't say, ignore the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees. What does he say? He says, do what they teach you. Verse 3. Jesus says that they rightly sit on Moses' chair. What do they mean by Moses' chair? Well, obviously we're not talking about a literal chair, but the chair of Moses, it's a figurative expression for the teaching authority that's derived from Moses, right? Moses gave, give, gives the law, he gives religion to the Israelites, but then he has to hand it on to someone else uh, to apply it, to interpret it when he's gone. It's a bit like, you know, the idea of, uh, Mike Kim, right, our last pastor here, he, he entrusts his vision to the leaders. Then he, when he leaves, we're supposed to be the ones to carry on the seed that he's planted. So the scribes and the Pharisees are successors of the Mosaic tradition, just like pastors are the successors of the Christian religion. And so Jesus recognizes that even when, even when leaders fail to lead by example, even if preachers and pastors are corrupt, it doesn't just mean that all Christian teaching is wrong. Now, I'm not saying this to try and get leaders off the hook. And in fact, I always want to say that you guys have a responsibility to keep the pastoral staff here accountable to their words and their actions. You really do. But Jesus reminds us, don't reject the church just because of the mistakes of some bad apples. Don't throw away religion because some of its leaders are hypocrites. Learn to distinguish between the teaching and the teacher. If your faith is dependent upon the perfection of your leaders, I'm sorry to tell you guys, but your leaders aren't perfect. And again, I'm not, it's, this is not about some open confessional. I'm not trying to say that any of us have done anything wrong, right? But you get the point. You can look for a truth in a teaching even when the teacher might be a bad person. Don't hate religion because of hypocrisy. That would be like hating the game of basketball because of a few bad players. It would be like hating pizza because of a few wrong toppings. It would be like hating America because of a few corrupt politicians. I mean, it just doesn't really make sense, does it? Oh, by the way, on a side note, um, speaking of pizza, we are having a young adult uh, lunch after the service today. So I just want to say right now, if you are between the ages of about, we're going to say 21 to 35, although there's some leeway there because I'm 37, so technically I don't even count as a young adult, uh, we'd really love to get to meet you. So if you're, if you're within the age of 21 to 35, please come right after the service in the Young Adult Cafe. Grab a slice of pizza. We want to get to know you. We want to form a community. And some of you, I've been here for two years. Some of you, I, I see you every week, but I still don't know your names. So please, please do make an effort to come just so we can get to know you uh, right after the service today. Sorry about that side note. Okay, so... What is it then that Jesus does take so much issue with in today's passage? Well, quite simply, it's the way that these teachers don't embody what they teach. It's the way that these teachers don't live out their message. Again, don't discard the preaching when it's not practiced, but, and this is the main point today, if church is going to be truly effective, if our church is going to be truly successful, its leaders must practice what they preach. And don't put this all on us, because I think Jesus is not just talking to leaders, he's talking to all Christians. So this passage is not just for me and the other pastors, it's for all of us. Jesus says, and again, follow the passage you have there. Jesus says, you tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, 
and you lay them on the shoulders of people, but you're unwilling to lift a finger to move them. In other words, you make religion so difficult for people, but then you do nothing to help them. You guys ever done anything like that? Do you enjoy maybe just telling people about the Adventist truth and then kind of just walking away? So we love telling people what they need to do, don't we? But how good are we at actually holding their hands through the process of transformation if it takes a long time? But I, I, this is one passage which I love in First Thessalonians. Listen here how Paul throws his whole life into ministry and works tirelessly to make religion not difficult, to make religion easy for people. Paul says, We were gentle among you, as a nursing mother cares for her children. With such affection for you, we were determined to share with you, get this, not only the gospel of God, but our very selves as well. So dearly beloved had you become to us. You recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and, and drudgery, working night and day in order not to burden any of you, we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. And what Jesus goes on to say that he hates more than anything is pomp and pretense and self-aggrandizement. The way leaders focus on ostentatious performances of piety with their broad phylacteries and long fringes. What does he mean there? Well, these phylacteries are these small leather boxes that the Jews would wear on their heads and small leather boxes that would contain biblical texts, you know? And so, and, and the fringes that he's talking about are the tassels that would have been attached to the Jews and the rabbis to their to their cloaks, their gowns that they would wear. So he's saying these guys would, would enlarge these phylacteries, would make their tassels longer in order to draw attention to themselves, right? You get the point? And what does this mean for us? Well, I'm sure that we have similar devices, don't we? Maybe we think, you know, the bigger my Bible is, the more people will think that I read it. Maybe the more expensive my suit is, the more people will take me seriously as a holy man. Maybe the louder I sing, the more people will assume that I'm closer to God. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with big Bibles. This is my Bible. It's quite big, right? There's nothing wrong with big Bibles, nothing wrong with nice suits, nothing wrong with singing hymns loudly. But Jesus isn't easily fooled. He knows that people tend to use external objects as a disguise for an, for an internal lack of spirituality. So ask yourselves, what have you used to disguise your lack of spirituality? What do you do on the outside that's covering up what's, what's really going on on the inside? And then Jesus speaks out against those leaders who look for every occasion to get the best seat in the house, where they can be noticed, where they can be revered, where they can be talked about. Those people who need to be addressed with honorific titles, those who need to be the center of attention at every dinner party, at every social event, at every worship service. We all know people like this, don't we? Those people who need everything to be about them. But the church must never encourage that behavior. And in James 2, uh, it's really obvious. In James 2, Scripture forbids very precisely this type of favoritism. Talking about church, check out this passage. If a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your church, and if a person, if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, oh, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, sit at my feet. If you do that, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's a pretty indicting passage, isn't it? But in the end, God won't put up with people of high rank who use their reputations to seek attention. And he urges the church 
do not give them that attention. And so in his rant about the hypocritical nature of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus isn't rejecting religion. He's saying that whatever these guys are doing simply isn't real religion. Jesus is not anti-religion. Jesus is anti-corrupt religion. That makes sense? So if you reject religion that's gone wrong, if you reject religion that's full of pretension and hypocrisy and attention-seeking, then Jesus says, I'm right there with you. So do I. I hate that religion too, he says. But scripture says, again in James, describing religion, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You want to really be religious? Then don't give preferential treatment to the pastors or the leaders or the wealthy or the successful or the popular. Instead, care for the poor. Care for the vulnerable. Serve those who have nothing to give you in return. Find someone who needs assistance. Find someone who needs friendship. Find someone who needs compassion and pour your whole life into them. Serve, serve, serve. Jesus ends by reminding us that we really have only one ultimate authority. One rabbi, one teacher, one father. There is only one person we need to impress, only one person who holds us truly accountable. And that is, of course, our God. And we impress him, how? By being truly religious. So to those who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I want to say that we are religious, but we're focused on getting religion right. And we know what religion is because our teacher, Jesus Christ, embodied it, didn't he? It says in Philippians, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and humbling himself. So friends, let us learn from our one true teacher. Let's embody a religion that's all about humility and service and compassion. My hope is for all of us that we practice what we preach. Guys, would you stand and let's respond to this message, respond to this passage with our closing hymn, hymn number 547, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>
So may we leave this place bringing true religion into the world. May we practice what we preach and embody the religious principles of love, inclusion, humility, and compassion. And may our one true Father be pleased with us as we live out our obedience to our true teacher, his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.